Hi everyone, I'm Eli, and today we're going to be talking about what it means to be trans. One of the most common questions I get is if you need dysphoria to be transgender. As someone who has been deeply involved in the community for the past eight years and has studied trans history, I find this to be a really interesting and important set of questions. This question can actually mean two different things depending on how you're defining dysphoria. There's body dysphoria on one hand, and then on the other, there's social dysphoria. These are related but different types of distress that one might feel internally related to their gender. I'm going to be more focused on body dysphoria because usually when people ask this question, that's what they actually mean and overlook the social dysphoria altogether. First of all, what is body dysphoria? It's usually distress related to how someone relates to their body in terms of sex characteristics like fat distribution, body hair, and genitalia. For example, I used to be really dysphoric about having rough skin before I started hormones. I felt that it was kind of masculinizing and manly. Now, I don't always experience dysphoria after being on hormones for a few years. Now, on the other hand, social dysphoria would be my distress over not being perceived as a woman. This is often related to but separate from body dysphoria. In the trans community, there is a lot of debate over whether people are still trans if they don't have dysphoria at all. Usually this means body dysphoria. I'll say I used to fall into this category thinking people did actually need dysphoria, and this was until a few years ago when I got more educated on trans history and the community at large. I think this is really more of an issue of language than anything else. What do we actually mean by transgender? What does this word signify? That's really the question we should be asking. Activists, writers, and scholars have been using this term trans or transgender since the 1960s, although it didn't really catch on until the early 90s when Leslie Feinberg published Transgender Liberation. The purpose of the word transgender was to create a broader term than transsexual, or people who medically transitioned and often felt they were male or female. Transsexual fell out of favor when it confuse the general public about the sexuality of trans people, and it's actually now largely considered a pejorative or dated term, so only some trans people use it. Transgender, on the other hand, was and still is considered a large amount of gender diversity, including people with or without body dysphoria. Now, there's a group who are trying to argue that trans folks without body dysphoria actually aren't transgender and are capitalizing off of trans identity. There's another large group that argues anyone who has ever claimed any sort of queer or trans identity are valid and can't ever be questioned under any circumstances. Now, the groups aren't necessarily as rigid as that, but those are generally the two camps. I want to address both of these frameworks that need to be critically engaged with and largely transformed. The debate is primarily online, actually almost exclusively online, particularly YouTube, Tumblr, and Instagram, the places you'd expect. So I want to get into some history of where it came from, what it does, and how these rigid positions ignore the many ways people interact with gender. First, let's talk about the position that excludes people without dysphoria. They're sometimes labeled online as true scum, which started as a pejorative term, but was reclaimed by the group. They're also known as trans medicalists or sometimes even trans fundamentalists. The people following this concept claim they're protecting real trans people somehow by complaining about non-binary trans people, trans folks without dysphoria, and trans people using pronouns other than he or she. The group claims they're making trans people more respectable or more consumable for cisgender people. While this terminology is newer, the ideology actually popularized far back, specifically with Harry Benjamin's 1966 book, The Transsexual Phenomenon. Benjamin's book argued that trans people who experienced only the most severe dysphoria and were straight were valid, deserving of hormone treatment, or were eligible for surgery at all. Because this book, queer trans people or trans folks who didn't perfectly fit within diagnostic criteria were denied necessary medicine. Those who did fit the criteria were labeled as true transsexuals, which is actually where true scum comes from. And this is still exactly what's happening today. Trans people are still denied necessary health care and respect because people assume if we don't fit into cis ideals of gender, we're not truly trans. Admitting that not all trans people have dysphoria won't prevent us from obtaining healthcare. It simply means that not all of us need it. One of the foundational arguments of trans medicalism is that trans is a medical condition. I'll admit, I used to believe this too. I thought that being trans was a medical condition and that this would help us gain treatment until I actually did more research and learned 
there's no evidence for this, which I went over in detail in a past video. Link right next to me. The TLDR version of that video will come down to the fact that no study has ever actually proven or even indicated there was some sort of innate biological difference between trans or cis people. Trans medicalists also falsely argue that people are trying to lump drag queens and cross-dressers into the trans umbrella. This isn't actually true, and very few people, although some, are trying to do that. There are some few older graphics of the trans umbrella, like this one, that do try to do that, but most people don't listen to them. Drag queens usually aren't trans. And finally, we don't actually know much about this group because they're almost exclusively online. Based on profiles, people have noticed that these are generally white trans men who are in their teens or 20s. However, we don't know how many of them there are, and also how many of them are shell accounts for anti-trans feminist trolls who often align with them. Now, I also want to briefly touch on the other side of the debate, that all people's pronouns and genders are valid under any circumstances whatsoever. This isn't necessarily helpful either. There are some, well, a few exceptions. And here, I'll start with an anecdote. One time in college, I noticed a trend of cis women using she-they pronouns. Now, many people actually need they pronouns to exist, and cis people using them may accidentally delegitimize non-binary people. When I asked one of these cis women about it, when I was getting annoyed, she actually apologized and realized she was doing it for social capital in queer spaces. By attaching they to her pronouns, she felt more confident to speak in queer spaces about trans issues, because it sort of hid how cis she was. And I should add, this is a rare exception in a small liberal arts college. This does exist and is kind of an issue, but at the same time, we should be skeptical of people saying anyone who uses they pronouns isn't valid. This simply just isn't correct and isn't ethical. One other example where gender might not be valid would be white people identifying themselves as indigenous social categories, like Hydra or Two-Spirit, which does happen quite often. These categories are, of course, only usable by the cultures that they belong to in that specific context. So, in some rare exceptions like these, people's pronouns or genders may in fact not be valid. I also want to sympathize with the feelings that trans medicalists may have. Many of them had to fight to get medical treatment. I know it took me several years of fighting to just get hormones. I had to drive for hours, petition medical boards, and miss school. It sucks! Seeing people using our same identities without having to go through this struggle can be frustrating to say the least. Not having dysphoria is definitely a privilege. Not the erasure from the community, that also sucks, but rather having the feeling that certain body parts are simply wrong. Feeling distressed over your body. This doesn't mean that these same people are invalid. Rather, they're in a position of power. And then finally, I also want to swing back to social dysphoria. If trans medicalists argued you need social dysphoria to be trans, they might be closer to being right. Social dysphoria simply means you're distressed by being misgendered or perceived as another gender. This is closer to a common experience of trans people. However, it also doesn't apply to everyone. Some trans people simply don't care about being misgendered. So with all this information, hopefully you're now more informed on the debate. Where do you think you fall in the argument? Do you agree that trans people don't need dysphoria? Did I miss something? Let me know in the comments. And I'll see you next time.